Hey, hey, everyone. This is Carlos. I'm the founder and CEO at Product School. Today, I'm here with another founder and CEO. His name is Lloyd Lobo. Uh, hello. Welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for hosting me. Just co-founder now. I was co-founder and president at uh, Boast AI previously and uh, now co-founder and board member at the company. Let's talk about that that journey because I think it's fascinating, especially for founders to eventually find a way to stay really involved in their business, even though sometimes they can take more of a role on the board instead of having on the on the day to day. Definitely. So, Lloyd, maybe at the beginning of everything, I know you have a, a really interesting experience and background. Why do you, you tell us a bit more about where does where does that back to create something come from? You know, I get asked this a lot, and I have to look back so, so far back to me being a kid. And most people's childhood stories are like, oh, I did a lemonade stand, or I did this or that or the other thing. My childhood story was, was two profound moments, one of them being I was a refugee of the Gulf War. So I, I was, I think, eight or nine years old, and we had just finished fourth grade, summers that had hit. And one morning, my mother wakes me up and she says, I don't think you can go to school anymore. My first reaction was of excitement because I was pretty sure I failed my fourth grade exam. I used to study very last minute. I think I had a reading disability or something. So I studied for a math exam. I show up, it's a geography exam. So whole summer, I was stressed that I'm going to fail. And you know, failing fourth grade is about the worst thing that can happen, especially in an immigrant family. And we were in Kuwait and my mom wakes me up and says, the war hit, so you're not going to be able to go to school anymore. And my first reaction is, yes, you're never going to find out I failed. But then when it sank in, I started to see worry, right? Currency is invalid. The security in the uh, country has fully lapsed. You don't know if you're going to live or die. You can hear bombings. People are screaming, looting. No internet, no phones, right? This is 19, it's the 90s, early 90s. And so that day I go down my building with, with my dad and I see a number of concerned faces. And, you know, in 2023, when we hit, we all belabor on problems. You know, you see how in the news, all problems belabor. But that was a time where we didn't belabor on the problem. Very quickly, people started to come together to form solutions. That building became... I'll guard from six to 12. Somebody else is like, okay, I'll guard from 12 to six. Somebody else is like, I'm going to organize supplies. Then there were other people saying, hey, their families have been displaced. And, and others are like, okay, we'll help organize shelter. So um, every building became a sub-community. Every building became a sub-community, communicated with another building, another building, and it became the largest grassroots evacuation movement that took people to safety. And that day, I developed the appetite for two things, because what is entrepreneurship? Entrepreneurship is taking an idea to execution and impact while dealing with extreme risk and uncertainty. That was taking an idea to execution with extreme risk and uncertainty. And the other thing I got to understand was the power of community and community-led growth and how communities can drive impact where a country that is fully displaced is now rescued by the community. I mean, word of mouth from building to building spread, coordinated with embassies and evacuated the people. So it dates back there. And ever since I left that experience, I was always craving for more and more uncertainty. <laughs> And I, I'm sure there were a lot of learnings there. And one thing that came to mind as I, and I, as I hear your story is that entrepreneurship is not just building a tech startup. Entrepreneurship sometimes, especially in situations where it's about life or death, it's really about building something that works, solves a specific problem. And uh, all of these other factors around growth, venture capital, and long-term are very, very important eventually, but there has to be a fundamental problem that you are trying to solve. And sometimes you don't even need to incorporate a company to solve that company. Entrepreneurship can be that type of mindset. Exactly. You, you hit the nail on the head, right? It is about taking an idea, an obscure idea to fruition, to, com to execution, to impact while dealing with uncertainty, ambiguity, and risk and bringing people together. That is, that is it. And um, one thing that I noticed 
between founders and product managers is that in a way they product managers carry similar um, interest for identifying a problem and fixing it. Especially at the beginning, like a, a founder is wearing that hat. And I know that as the company evolves, there is a need to, to hire more and more product people, those problem solvers, regardless of how we want to call them. So I want to learn more about, about your own journey. Let's say, um, how did you, first of all, even before you started the company, I want to learn more about how you got that, that first job and how you started solving problems for others. Definitely. You know, I want to say that product management is one of my favorite jobs, okay? And it's, it's probably one of the best skills you can learn is to be in product management at an early stage company. One of the best, best, best skills by far, especially when I say early stage, meaning all the way to if you have the opportunity to be a product manager under a founder. There's no better skill than that because it'll it'll help you grow beyond belief, right? Because think about what you're doing. You're you don't have product market fit. So you're talking to customers, you're validating the idea, you're figuring out what to build, you're wireframing, you're testing it, and you're repeating the whole process. And everything that you learn there, because at that stage, you don't have a product marketer, you don't have a project manager. So you're doing everything yourself and you become so good at it that it helps you eventually hire the right people as you scale. So, so I wanted to start by saying that. So I studied engineering, okay? I studied a bachelor's in software engineering. One of the few schools at the time when I graduated had a bachelor's engineering degree in software. Now, I always had this appetite for risk and just surrounded by entrepreneurs wanted to go into business. So I asked somebody, what is the best, best skill I could learn if I wanted to be a business person someday? And they said, by far sales. Sales is the best skill. Selling is everything. And so my first job, I only applied to sales jobs. And nobody would give me a job as an account executive or a salesperson in any company. I mean, I applied to Xerox. I applied, you name it, tech companies, non-tech companies, applied everywhere. Because they're like awkward engineer. Why would I give them this job? So I begged my way to get an entry level cold calling job into a small company. And my parents freaked out, right? My parents are immigrants and they're like, our friends, kids who finished engineering are at Microsoft and these other companies. And you are <laughs> making cold calls for $30,000 a year is so embarrassing. Fast forward today, that skill, Carlos, I kid you not, was formative to me, helping me not only in product, but helping me as a founder, right? If you think about it, we often say we want to improve our skill in something. We want to be a better writer or a better product person. Yet we don't do the things that enable us to do that, to get there. The best way to become better at something that you suck at is to do a lot of it. Keep doing it, keep doing it. Because you start with volume. It's like, it's like, um, carving a sculpture. You start heavy and then you go fine and fine and refine. So you do it, you do it, you do it. And I knew that communication and in speaking with my relative who was an entrepreneur, that communication was the key skill. Is like, that's why he said go into sales. There's no other job that would let me communicate as much, right? Sales is the only job that will force you to communicate. And so, so I went into sales. And right? I think it's about like building and sell it. Like when it comes down to like the most basic skills for a business to continue growing, you, you have to have something that people want and you have to be able to communicate that and, and, and close it. Exactly. Exactly. And so it was the best skill I learned. And so then the next job I took was at a startup and it was to do sales like moving from cold calling to actually selling. Now, when I joined there, the job actually ended up being that, <laughs> that talk to customers, figure out what to build, what, <laughs> write down the specifications, give it to the developers. Then also, by the way, do all the product marketing and build the website and everything else. <laughs> now, I, I, I went to university in Canada and my first job was in Canada. And so when I moved to the States, I was on a visa. So I'm like, you know, I can't do anything. So yeah, you, you embrace it. 
And and so the skills I learned in cold calling was very helpful because now I could polish the messaging, pivot on the fly, learn to negotiate, learn to understand pain points. And so I started meeting very big companies like Tiffany and Company, Armani, Simon and & Schuster, and it was the best experiences ever. And the thing is, a few months after I joined, there was a COO who was managing that whole product process, that whole uh, department, and he left. And so they didn't fill that gap. So it, it became a great experience for me going meeting these big companies, then walking their plant floors, walking their facilities. It was a warehouse control system software company. And so understanding the entire flow and then designing what to build. Now, because I studied software engineering, I knew uh, you know, user experience was a course, software design was a course, and combined with communication, which I lacked so much graduating, now I could actually communicate to the customer and pull their pain points and then distill it to commonalities and then also convey that through wireframes and specifications to the developers on what to build. Yeah. And, 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 and so and that's how I transitioned. <laughs> and the, the funny thing is, also, especially in smaller companies, maybe there are not roles that specifically define what you're doing. They don't have the title product manager or business analyst or account executive. But at the end of the day, it's like when I'm as a founder, I look for people with potential and if I have problems, I'm going to try to delegate and try to put the, my best people in the biggest problems. And uh, it sounds, it makes sense, but it's also a little counterintuitive for that person saying, okay, like I'm busy. Why are you keeping me busy? Well, because busy people or overachievers always find a way to make things happen. Exactly. And you know, though, I don't fault anyone because this was 2005, six, yeah. And I don't think product manager was a title back then. No, I don't think so. Like there wasn't a yeah. title used, but it was ambiguous. Like engineers, you have engineers, you have analysts, but in a small company or a startup, it was ambiguous. So the salesperson, now I came and like, oh, talk to customers, figure out what to build and then sell it. But then I learned the third important skill, which was crucial for me is I now needed to write the messaging, build the websites and do all the product materials and everything. Like, you know, that was a time where it wasn't, the world wasn't so digital in that sense. And so I needed to learn everything about digital marketing and every piece of information that I could find online was from HubSpot's inbound marketing community. So I was a big part of that inbound marketing community. I took their inbound marketing certification. Uh, Gary Vaynerchuk, from, he, who had, was a chubby guy back then, he had Wine TV and he ran a course on YouTube marketing. So I learned all of that and launched the company's website and did all the product materials, the brochures, all of that stuff. So the, the, the three things you learn, right? And, and I think these three things distills to actually two key skills. One is communication, written and verbal communication. And the other is creation. Yeah. To be a great product manager, you need you need to. And, and I and I agree with that third point that you added because especially at the very beginning, you can get away by being the product and the salesperson. You can go one on one, have conversations with with people, get that feedback, build, deliver. But it gets to a point you need to scale yourself and your product. And that third leg, what some people would call marketing or communication, distribution, however you want to call it, it's important to be able to communicate with people at scale when you are not the one having that type of one-on-one -on -one conversation. So obviously a copy on your website or other types of ways you can empower people to relay the message the right way so the user can understand the product before they, they decide to buy. It's ultimately that type of flywheel. And, and I think as, as founders, it's, there's a lot of value in being the product first and, and doing a lot of the things that don't scale and eventually figuring out ways to scale ourselves. Exactly, exactly. And if you don't do anything yourself, it becomes very hard to figure out what good looks like, especially when you're going from a startup to a scale-up, right? The way I look at it, there are four distinct phases in a startup. You have an idea, you need to validate it. Let's call it validation. How do you validate the idea? Talk to maybe 10, talk to hundreds of customers or create landing pages, whatever it is. Talk to customers, figure out their pain point, figure out 
if your proposed solution resonates, then maybe get 10 people to invest their time or money to try it out. You have validation. You have message market fit. Then you shift to product market fit. And what is product market fit? Say you expand that cohort of 10 to 50. And let's look at it from a B2B SaaS angle. Each is paying you 20,000 ACV. What is product market fit effectively is you have high retention, low churn, high retention. People at validation said, I have a problem. Your message resonates. I'm going to try it out. At product market fit, they say, every time I have this problem, I'm going to keep coming back to you. So the lagging indicator or the success metric is retention. And the leading indicator is engagement. If I'm not using the product, even if I bought your annual contract, I'm not going to uh, stick around. Then the third phase is product channel fit, where you figure out a repeatable, scalable channel to grow the company, grow the business, to acquire customers. And then the fourth is once you, once you hit product channel fit, then you know, hey, I have one kind of customer who comes one kind of channel, comes through one kind of channel, and gets one kind of value. Now at scale, I'm putting 75% fuel on the fire, and 25% I'm trying new things, new products, new markets, new features, whatever it is, you're scaling. And that becomes a calm conversation. Now, your journey as a founder also changes as you traverse that, right? At validation, you're jack of all founder, you're doing any, everything. At product market fit, maybe you hire two salespersons, maybe you hire a product manager, right? You're still not a CEO or a president or whatever, you're still founder. A lot of people, they immediately think they're CEO and everything is beneath them, or they immediately the president or immediately C-suite. So at, at that point, when you hire two, three people, you become a manager. You're still not C-suite. At product channel fit, you hire a manager to manage the individual contributors. So now you've gone from validation individual contributor to product market fit being a manager. And at product channel fit, now you're a VP. You're still executing, right? And you hire, you hire managers to manage the individual contributors. At scale, you become a strategist, you become a C-suite. And a lot of people don't make that journey or they jump to being C-suite and strategy too soon. Well, let's let's talk about these, these layers because I, I think there's obviously so many things you can acquire just by, by failing, by, by doing, but hopefully we can at least pinpoint some of those learnings for you. And I think when you have nothing to manage, you are the product, you are the founder, you are everybody. Get to a point you are have you have a team and you are the direct manager for them, but eventually you are going to be in the manager of managers, and depending on how long that how big that company is, some of those managers might be very very senior, and right? especially when you raise money, there's this intention to hire people who've been there, who've done that, who have this resume, who have worked at a larger company, who've seen this movie, and are going to somehow solve the problem for you. So. Can you tell us a bit more about that experience, kind of scaling yourself and hiring those first managers of managers? You know, you know I'll caveat this by saying one thing, right? Um, you have to understand your genius or your expertise and where you shine, and you have to fill the gaps, what you hate doing. Ultimately, if you don't find joy in the work you're doing, You'll never be able to scale your scale self or scale the company. You'll get burnt out. So one, you got to figure out what am I passionate about? Am I passionate about product? Am I passionate about talking to customers? Am I passionate about evangelizing the company? Because when you're an individual com contributor as a founder, you're doing many things and you fill your gaps, number one. Number two, I think one of the key learnings I had is hiring people very specific to your stage, number one, and hiring jack of all or Swiss army knives. There's this fallacy that you need to hire specialists. And I think a lot of mistakes we make is hiring specialists too soon. Unless you have a very specialized product for a very specialized need, specialists make sense in certain aspects. But let's say you hire a head of marketing that only specializes in brand. But, you know, you need to flex in five different ways. You haven't figured out your channel yet. So how is a brand marketer going to help you? You need to, you need to understand what are all the demand generation techniques. You need to understand if, if next month am I going to spend money on ads or next month am I going to spend money 
on um, on a, on SEO or maybe you know you're building a community. So you what what bringing on a jack of all trades does is they can try different things and they may have expertise in one thing, but they're not averse to executing or using their hands. So I love this hiring jack of all, like not specialists and stretching those specialists as long as possible. Uh, sorry, uh, hiring generalists and stretching those generalists as long as possible. I think some of the biggest growth has come from hiring generalists who can flex in different directions. Because think about what you're doing. You're making this journey from... I, from validation to product market fit to product channel fit. In each stage, there's an inherent risk. In, in validation, you don't know if your message is going to resonate. In product market fit, you don't know if your product is going to resonate where they stick around. So there is a risk of engagement right, or usage. And in product channel fit, you don't know which channel is going to work. So you have a risk of losing, you know, exploding your CAC or just, you know, <laughs> burning through cash to get customers. I agree. And, and I think that applies to other area, other functions. I've seen this in product. By definition, product managers might come from a specialist area, but eventually become generalists because they need to be good enough at engineering, design, data, marketing, sales. You, exactly. You name it. Um, but I think the other part you mentioned is seniority or size of the company. Because I, I agree with you, hiding generalists that can flex and and figure things out is important. Let's talk about the other dimension, which is, okay, My I, I achieve product market fit. My company is, is growing. I have a good idea on what needs to be done. So I'm going to hire someone to, to take it from here. Hopefully that person is, is better than you. But how much experience or you know access to larger companies does that person need to have? So I'll give you a similar example to how we started the conversation in the in the green room, right? So you said you love your podcast to be tactical advice, not high-level CEO platitudes, right? Not high-level C-suite platitudes. So think about it the same way. If you're at validation, bring on a leader, right? At validation, in fact, you shouldn't hire any external leader. If the founders can't do it, then I don't know how you're going to build a startup. But let's say you're at product market fit. And uh, you're roughly like maybe, you know, you've raised a seed round. You have small MRR. Let's let's call it like anywhere from between ten and a hundred thousand MRR. So like a hundred thousand to a million ARR. I would hire somebody who's made the journey from zero to five, right? As as a head of, you don't need to hire VP and you don't need to hire. Um, C-suite. Firstly, delay hiring people with C titles, especially from big companies, as long as possible. Most of our mistakes came from there. Most of our, genuinely, most of our mistakes came from there. So you know how your product hits product market fit? There's departments also in your company that hit product market fit, right? So let's say, again, the same thing. Every department goes through validation, product market fit, and then scale. So let's say sales is your channel. Initially, you were doing founder-led sales, then you hire two people and they're humming really well. Then you hired a manager and the manager hired four more people. And now the sales department is doing really well. So, okay, you're ready for a VP. You're ready to scale. But let's say you're on the product team and you somehow stretch to freaking five, 10 million in revenue with founder doing product, okay? And communicating with the developers. How can you now go from being a founder-led product manager to hiring a CPO from a large company because a CPO from a large company, think about it. C level is execution is, is strategy, some execution, VP is execution and, and managers, senior managers are more execution. Now as a founder who's mostly managed product from the idea validation stage to scale, if you suddenly bring a CPO from a large company, it's going to be friction. Because they need a team. Yeah. But it's so tempting, right? You have a problem. You don't have time. You see someone who buy the book, checks the boxes, speaks well, comes from big company, assume that, oh my God, that person probably saw this movie and they have a playbook. I think there's a huge difference between running a playbook at another company and being able to build a playbook. No two so companies are the same and you hit the nail on the head. Seeing the playbook is very different than building the playbook. 
And so the way I look at it is if you're at product market fit and you need to bring on anybody, whether it's head of marketing, head of sales, head of product, it needs to hit two or three criteria. Criteria number one is have they seen the journey from product market fit to scale? Were they early enough at a company that is like maybe 10,000 to 100,000 MRR that made the journey to 5 million, 10 million ARR? That's number one. Number two, if, 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 they've, if they've seen that journey, then they've created the playbook, definitely, right? If you're 10,000 MRR and now your company is doing 10 million ARR, you have to have created the playbook. There's no other way. And number two, can they still execute? Can they roll up their sleeves? I have, I think these two skills are paramount to whoever you hire in product. They need to have an eye for user experience because everything is user experience. The world is user experience. Hiring a very technical product, product leader doesn't serve you well if they don't understand user experience. Everything, the whole world, this, this interaction, the world falls apart without user experience. Having great communication and great creativity, which to me is user experience. So those, those three things are really important. Have they seen the journey? Can they communicate and, and not communicate to inform? Because if you're communicating to inform, you can send an email. The job of a leader is to build, inspire, and motivate a team to deliver. Deliver is a lagging indicator. So how do you build, inspire, and motivate a team? By communicating the vision to drive excitement and energy because people who are excited and energized can move mountains. And if you can't communicate like that, you're whatever it is, you're not a good leader. And the, and the, and the third thing is user experience, right? And so the other reason why communication is so important, Carlos, is when you're a new product manager, your first month, if you don't spend time talking to customers, then Man, that's a bad signal, right? Yeah, I, I come from an engineering background as well, like, like you. And so I yeah. never really properly learned communication. I come from a world where you have to do an exercise. It either works or it doesn't. There's no much gray area. And that, that really threw me off for, for the early stages of my career. And I don't think I was a great communicator. Um, I had to learn it the hard way. And that's something that I kept in mind because when I hire leaders, either they're managers of managers or just managers of individual contributors. Sometimes I over-index on the ability to get things done, UX design or other skills, because I know that if you are good at your job and you can prove it, maybe you can learn how to better communicate. And maybe that's just my own bias of you know, not being able to hire or failing at hiring some really good people just because I thought they, they, they communicated so well that sometimes I didn't I, I fully I, I didn't validate enough like how good they were. Um, so I found success sometimes hiring that lieutenant, that number two at a company that maybe is less polished and it's yeah. more hands-on because I know they still they probably did most of the work and they still have the hunger to prove themselves in a number one position. Sometimes that number one role, especially a larger company, comes with too much you know, like things fluff. So anyway, yeah. what, what's your take on that? Definitely, I, I agree with that. So what I described is a unicorn, right? Great communicator and not communicating um, pizzazz, but communicating to evangelize, right? Because a, a lot of what you do, you have to convince your dev team to do this project, right? You have to convince customers that, hey, I'm not going to ship the feature this month, but like, you know, you got to use this hack or you got to c convince the CEO of the company that, no, I'm not going to build this. I don't care how much you're in love with this idea and you think it's the vision, but now is not the right time. So that is, when I say communication, meaning it's, it's a skill not to like create buzz, but it's a skill to evangelize people and influence them to your way of thinking. So that, I think that is important. And the, and the second one is ability to execute with speed, creation, right? Execution creation with speed. And UX is a big part of that. Urgency is a big part of that. So what I what I like to ask is, have you ever been in a situation, describe to me a situation where you had to ship a big feature within a certain crunch time frame, and what are all the things that failed? <laughs> and what would you do better? But the the other thing, what, what I find 
is all our failures, I kid you not, man, came from hiring big company execs too early. I, I, I don't know how else to say, and maybe I'm a data point of one, but that data point of one is valid when I've talked to hundreds of other people, but all our failures, I mean, I say failures meaning hard lessons because the company is doing great. We've like, you know, since the funding we've doubled or more, um, has come from hiring big company execs who don't understand the pulse of a startup. So I think one of the key things there is hiring stage specific, meaning somebody who has, if you're trying to make the journey from one to five, then somebody who's made that journey, who's created that playbook. Now, if you're st starting to, trying to go from 10 to 20, don't hire somebody who's at a company that's doing a billion in revenue, right? Because their, their teams may be bigger than your whole company. Hire somebody who's seen the journey from 10 to 100, who's written that playbook. And a lot of the times when you hire companies, hire people from companies that are at a billion in revenue, big public companies, they look so good in resumes. But by the time they joined that company, that company was way past 100 million. They never created the playbook. So yeah. you said it right. The, the, the Hire the people who create the playbook. And it doesn't really have to be somebody who was... who. You know, you can be one down from the person who created the playbook, but they're part, they actively experience creating the playbook. They can communicate to evangelize and influence people to their way of thinking. And they have a good eye for user experience. I even like the user experience skill across the executive team, minus maybe finance, but even the marketing person, even the salesperson leader needs to have some sense of user experience because it just brings calm, right? When you have this conversation. Otherwise, people are just going to ask you, like, give me this, give me that. You need to have basic, you, sh you should love products, okay? Uh, if you love products, you'll understand user experience. And, and I think the, the misconception with user experience is that it's just associated with design and purely. Which is not. How, and, and exactly, it's not. And then bringing this down to how actually things work, it's, it's what everybody, I expect to have, a, like, an appreciation for, for the product. Obviously, as a, if you work in product, you should understand from inside out, but it's long gone are those days where sales receives something and says it and doesn't really care about how it's built yeah. or marketing is just pushing a message, right? Like, you know, that's, that's what I like about this, this founder or product mindset, which is like, we all, we all the product, like how can we keep parts of that DNA that made the company successful in the first place? So when other people join, they don't just, work on one thing or delegate the others and they really really care about what we are doing because ultimately if you you're talking about extending agreements or like preventing churn upselling those customers it's only going to happen if your product is excellent like you can't just maybe you can fake the first deal you can't you cannot fake an excellent customer experience you cannot and that's why i think it's really important that everyone to have some skills and you know not everyone needs to have the deep you like you know you can go 100% in everything that's not the goal but you can if you have 80% it's good right so the two courses i recommend and i took early in my time is there's a there's a good ux course on coursera i think it was from ucla but there's a bunch now and there's a course by janice fraser on udemy called seven steps to building a startup and um, i recommend to all early stage founders to just take this course um, and and it's it's invaluable because it tells you so much about not only talking to customers, but it tells you what to build, how to how to prioritize the feature, how to wireframe it, how to craft user stories. And I actually recommend anyone to take it because it'll it'll take five hours of your life, but not you'll know more than most founders, right? I'm gonna drop the link here. Um, Perfect. I know you are very passionate about sharing your knowledge, and that's why you started this community called Traction back in 2014. So what, can you tell us a little bit more about what it is and, and uh, what other things you, you do for, for fellow founders? Definitely. So this Traction, you know, in a way you can say accidental community, right? Because the name came much after, but we'd been running the community for a long time before. So my co-founder, Alex, and I, when we started the company, Boast, Boast is a fintech platform that automates access to funding for product development and, and research and development for companies. Like globally, hundreds of millions of dollars are given in funding by governments 
but it's a broken application process. It takes a long time to get the money and you can get audited. So we said, we'll automate and streamline this process so companies can get access to non-dilutive funding from the government faster for less time and risk. And initially we started with streamlining the application process and digitizing it. Then we raised, uh, secured a hundred million fund to lend to those companies. And now because we have this unique data set of R&D data combined with financial data, we're creating a new set of tooling around R&D analytics. So basically engineering R&D productivity. So who you should hire, what projects you should invest in, and so on and so forth. Now, when we started the company, nobody wanted to talk to us, right? Because imagine you got two guys in an apartment, cold calling companies saying, buy my stuff. And my stuff is, hey, give me your product development data and I'll get you money from the government. It sounds scammy, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> and, and then when you Google search the, these, uh, these things, it's largely done by big accounting firms. So the you know we were getting dejected because the larger the company we tried to target, um, the harder it was. And so we started running around in the startup community and meeting other founders and talking to them. And this was 2012. This was a time when all the conferences were like not tactical. Everyone was like big name CEO talking about high level platitudes. And I started. We started running around the community. We participated in startup weekend events and so on. And we wanted to learn for ourselves, actually, you know what, how do we really get customers? And so we started meeting. And, and in going in the startup community, found, we found that not only we found our tribe, who was like easy to communicate with compared to like going after manufacturing or agriculture, or any big industry, but we also found that these people don't have the tactical knowledge to build their companies because we weren't getting any learnings. So we said, hey, why don't we flip the script here? Why don't we, you know, we as people, as two guys who've been part of other startups before that have failed, we at least know good founders that we can invite. So maybe not the unicorn guys, but maybe somebody who's like got to 10, 20, 30 million in revenue. So why don't we invite them and host meetups and ask them to share very tactical advice? See, this was a time where all the conferences were run by event managers. So I don't fault them. They just don't know what to ask, right? So you're a founder, so you can ask me the right questions. If you're not a founder, you're going to ask me my aspirational story and I'm, I'm going to be 50,000 foot. I'm not going to talk about like how I did A, B, and C. Yeah. So because we were founders, we started hosting events and then our email went something like, hey, founder, we're inviting X influencer to talk about Y topic, like Y topic being how do you build your first product? How do you build your MVP? How do you validate your idea? How do you get your first customers? Very tactical topics, right? And uh, we only have 10 spots. There's going to be pizza. I would love for you to join. We sold the 10, first 10 spots. It was free. The next time we did the event, more 10 people, more 10 people. Every time more and more people used to come. One day, 200 people showed up to the co-working space, man. And the co-working space guys are like, listen, this is not a meetup, a pizza meetup. Now you hijacked all the tables and everything on the floor. This is a conference. And this was a time where you know podcasts weren't so prevalent and uh, you know, they weren't like Saster and stuff wasn't there. And, and so that evolved then eventually into the traction community, which today we host a big conference. We host a podcast every week. At peak, we were doing two live podcasts a week. So on YouTube and, uh, and on Spotify and webinar and, uh, and then retreats every other quarter, and then small dinners in different cities. It evolved, and now its traction has about 120,000 subscribers. But the funny thing is we build this community to educate ourselves. We build a community of practice. And there's three kinds of communities you can build, but community of practice is bringing a community together to learn about a specific topic. A community of product is to evangelize your product and become a specialist in the product. And then there's a community of play, which is coming together to have fun, like a Harley Davidson community or a Nike community. But we build a community of practice because we were founders. We wanted to learn how to grow our business. And coincidentally, what happened was all those people that started coming to a community not only ended up becoming customers, but other partners started showing up to the community. And, and so we built this great dynamic of a community where we were able to bootstrap Boast with no marketing team to 10 million with the power of this community because not only we got customers from it, but we got partners. We built partnerships with accountants, bankers, incubators, accelerators that started referring us business. And it gave us good social proof because think about it, from two guys who are cold calling you from an apartment to say, give me your data, which is, man, you're giving your IP to somebody. 
it requires a lot of credibility to now we're inviting you to events and you're seeing eventually like folks like Jeff Lawson coming to our events or Uber's previous CEO came to a meetup. Then we have the social proof. I call it brand rub. You associate with somebody who has significant social proof. So you get credibility. Now, if you do that repeatedly, you follow in this path of visibility, credibility, and then you make money. So profitability. I think uh, you and I have been living a, a parallel life in that way because I also started the product community in 2014 for a very s similar reason and just wanted to learn from the best in our own industry. And then from there, really finding value for the people, not just for myself. And then uh, I think the consistency piece that you mentioned is critical. Because sometimes we look at this right now and be like, oh my God, there is a conference. There's a hundred thousand members in your community. Well, because you've been grinding for almost 10 years, starting in very small places, one founder at a time and ensuring that those founders get value because otherwise they're not going to, they're not going to recommend this to other people. Like I think, especially when you're doing things in person, you're putting your name out there. And for me to recommend someone to come and spend their time or sometimes their money in this, I'm only going to do it if I believe in it. So how were you able to create that first group of evangelizers that were able to help you bring other founders to the community? Definitely. So, because we were not looking for anything, right? And we started the call the community traction. Firstly, initially it had no name. So it was like, oh, the boast guys are running an event and they bring cool people. We were not selling. And that's the thing, right? I'm not saying not to monetize. If you don't monetize your community, you will not sustain. But there's a way to monetize, right? So this was a time when startups had no other support, okay? Accountants, bankers, lawyers would make fun of us. They're like, ah, we're going to eat your lunch. Why are you going after this startup market? They're all going to go out of business. Go after manufacturing. It's huge. You know, you win in life by having a contrarian view and being right. And we bet that, this is in 2012, that the startup market is going to explode and it's going to drive our business. And fast forward, it did, right? And um, when you're helping, and I, and I truly believe this, fall in love with your customer, and make them successful beyond your product or service. Yesterday's innovation always becomes tomorrow's commodity, right? GPS, you couldn't get your hands on it. Then the GPS became an option. Now there's CarPlay, it's a commodity. But if you build a community, you won't become a commodity because you have this constant feedback loop of customers, of, of product feedback, of brand recognition, and they want to help you. I'll give you a very good example of this. In the 80s, Harley Davidson almost went bankrupt. When the Jap Japanese manufacturers and the electronics were getting commoditized, they started bringing these fancy sport bikes. And the company almost went bankrupt. And you know, it's a physical product, but nonetheless, the example applies to us all. And Harley Davidson leadership made community a company strategy, not a marketing strategy. They started sending the leadership out and started rider clubs around the camaraderie of writers. They built a community of play. And bikers became employees, employees became bikers. And over time, they created this ritual around weekend rides, getting together weekend rides, coming together. And those writers started the Save Harley movement. And not only they save Harley, but today they run campaigns to cure cancer and autism and all of these things, right? And so that's what it does. And, and they leverage the community to get feedback, to build future products. And now they have this, one of the strongest iconic brands, right? You can recognize a Harley Davidson fan just by what they're wearing. So I think, I think that, is, that, is the, that is the key element is if you start by saying, how can I make money from you? People are going to be turned off. So there's, like I said, three kinds of communities. Community of practice, which is helping people together, what you and I started there's a community of play, which is like Harley Davidson or Nike's, where you bring people to have fun, Red Bull's community. And there's a community of product, which is GitLab's community. You code together or Atlassian's community. You learn to build the product, right? You, yeah. you become a promoter of the product. If wow. you don't have product market fit, don't build a community of product because people think you're trying to sell to them. I think that's a great point. Uh, building community sounds great, especially when hearing it from a successful community leader. But I think the story behind becoming successful is what is sometimes uh, overlooked. And um, an example, I, I was going to say, examples of communities of product could also be like Figma 
or Muta, some of these successful products definitely with strong product market fit that have a ton of users. And those products are so flexible that allow so many different use cases that even the core company can't come up with. So they, they are able to empower community makers, like people who are users, to share templates, to share stories, help each other out. I think that could be a good example, a community of product for a lot of product leaders out there thinking, okay, if I were to, to create something, maybe a community of practice is it's too broad for a specific product. Maybe a community of play is it's also like very deep. It's hard to come up with and you need a really strong brand recognition. But I think everyone, anyone who's on that post product market fit phase could spend some additional time figuring out how users are using your product. And if that leads to a community and you can put customers to talk to other customers, that is fascinating. Definitely, definitely, exactly, right? Like Notion, like Canva, um, that's, that sort of thing. So you've, you've described it right. But when you don't have product market fit and you're just trying to build an early community, then, you know, like HubSpot did this, right? I said in the early days, everything I learned about marketing and product marketing and sales or some HubSpot's inbound community, HubSpot didn't really have much of a product. So I started searching marketing, sales, product marketing. I started learning all these things, joined their community. They, didn't, they had a community of practice, how to make people better marketers, better digital marketers. Gainsight also, in the early days, they had the Pulse customer success community. They didn't have yeah. a product, right? But then now that they have a product market fit, as they got product market fit, got like you know, 50, 100, hundreds of customers, then they created a sub-community within the key community around a community of product. Yeah. And, I, and I, I like those points, HubSpot, Gainsight, because at the very beginning, they didn't push product. It really tried to become that community of practice by learning best practices regardless of the product. Eventually, obviously, as you as you get product, you, you can you can find ways to to evangelize, monetize your community. But I think being clear on like a community is is not just a sales mechanism. Otherwise it's not a community. It's a, it's an audience and that's fine. Like not every company should have a community. But I think if you want to create something bigger than yourself, bigger than your company, there has to be value for the users beyond your product. Exactly, right? That's why I keep saying, fall in love with your customers and make them successful beyond your product or service. So I'll give you one very key example, right? So, you know, I, as I mentioned, I'm writing this book from grassroots to greatness, 13 rules to build iconic brands with community-led growth. For that, I talked to about like a thousand leaders in the community, I joined a number of communities. I joined like Nas Daily, which is a big YouTuber with 20 million followers. He has a creator community, I joined that. I was already a part of a bunch like Saster, um, my community, I joined On Deck. I joined many communities. And then I talked to leaders from community-led brands. And I found not only 13 common rules when I was asking the same questions over and over again, but I actually found four distinct phases that every obscure idea which became eventually a worldwide phenomenon that went, went through that. Four distinct phases, from Christ to CrossFit, every obscure idea that became a worldwide phenomenon went through these four distinct phases. People listen to you or buy your product or whatever it is, you have an audience. When you bring that audience together to interact with one another, it becomes a community. When that community comes together to create an impact, an impact that transcends your product or your profits, an impact that's tied to your purpose, it becomes a movement. And then through rituals, when the movement has undying faith in its purpose, it becomes a cult or a religion. And you think that through, right? And you look at, like I said, Christianity to CrossFit, but look at the journey of the most iconic bands. It's audience, community, movement, religion, or cult. And it's the same thing. They, they, people start listening to them. They bring them together. There's an impact. And you said it right, right? You have to help them beyond the product or service to build that community, to take that next step, that leap. And that's when you actually can become a movement. That's why Harley Davidson became a movement. That's why Mr. Beast, I mean, a non-tech product is a movement because, you know, helping uh, raise 20 million to pull out, to plant 20 million trees or 30 million to pull out 30 million pounds of plastic is, is a movement. And then 
you start forming these rituals like Harley Davidson has the weekly rides, right? Then you, then you CrossFit has the workout of the day. A lot of tech products have different rituals imbibed in them where, you know, initially they force you into the ritual rather through triggers, right? Emails, push notifications. Eventually what happens is you get so invested in the product ritual that it becomes a habit. And Nirial talks about a lot of this as well, but it becomes an internal trigger because you get some variable reward and then you make an investment and it becomes an internal trigger. That internal trigger, once it happens over and over again, that core action you can elevate to being a ritual. And if it leads to a greater, that ritual tied to a greater purpose beyond your product or profit will help you become a cult-like brand is, is what I started discovering. Well, Lloyd, it's been a pleasure to spend time with you and discuss community, executive hiding, playbooks, uh, your story. Uh, cold calling and, and building business as both and also community as attraction. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much. Great pleasure and look forward to hosting you on the Traction Podcast a couple of weeks from here.